Uh, let me start off uh, down below and just tell you a little bit about, again, you met my family, four kids. Uh, I want to show you an old prayer card because uh, it has everything to do with the talk. Here's an old prayer card. Many, many years ago, we had this prayer card made up. I want you to focus on the lovely woman in the center. That's Donna. That's my mother. My dad died back in 96, and so my mom has been living with us ever since. She lives downstairs full time with us. And uh, about four years into living with us, three years into living with us, her life was changed entirely. <laughs> the glory of God sang when my mother's life was changed. And uh, it wasn't because she was living with us. It was because my mother, at 84 years of age, got a phone call from her college boyfriend after 63 years of no communication. 63 years. They had been dating. World War II hit. Boom. They split up. They both got married. Both had children. Both had grandchildren. And they, both their spouses died. And after 63 years, he calls her up and says, do you remember me? She said, oh, yes. <laughs> he was the big man on campus. He said, can I come out for a visit? She said, well, yeah. And she got butterflies. 84 years of age, she's getting butterflies. So this guy flies out. I pick him up. He comes in a wheelchair, you know. He comes in a wheelchair. He's a World War II hero. He's written up in books. And, uh, and so he comes out. We get him in the car. This, this little scoundrel is holding my mother's hand before we get out of the parking lot of the airport. Found out that they were still in love and were married. Now they both live with us downstairs. <laughs> it's actually a wonderful story. Uh, he died a few years ago in my mother's arms. They were married for five years, and uh, he died in her arms. It was an absolutely wonderful romantic story. He was wonderful. She was a tremendous bride, a beautiful bride, a wonderful bride. But not all brides are wonderful. There are some very selfish brides, brides who marry... Uh, not so much for who he is, but for what he brings. And here's a video clip I want you to see. It's a video clip of a movie called It Takes Two. The man is a multimillionaire. He owns airtime, like Verizon airtime. And so he's got millions of dollars. And so she wants to marry him, but finds out maybe he's attracted to another woman. So she tries to speed up the wedding. Let's see what happens in this video clip. What is taking so long? Sorry, Sorry. my fault. Yes, you can. Okay. We were doing an audio check and I thought I had turned it off. Oh, well, let's go back to the beginning. Here we go. And are you trying to or not? Here we go. What is taking so long? Relax, Clary. Enjoy the moment. Uh, this is the happiest day of your life. I'm happy. Don't I look happy? <laughs> this is me happy. See? <laughs> happy, 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 happy. Let's get this show on the road. Get moving. One of the little daughters trying to slow things up because she, she likes the other woman better. She's going as slow as she can. I would have thought my first little girl would be the last to be Oh, Daddy. Shut up. I'm here. Let's do it. For which are uh, poor in sickness and under health as long as you both should be. I do. I do. I really do. Now him. What do we think of selfish brides? Good or bad? Ooh. Right. Why are they pursuing the groom? Because of money. Hey, let me ask you a question. What it would look like if the church were a selfish bride? Why would we pursue God? Not for who He is, but for what? What He could give us. Oh, God, 
You can take care of all my needs. Oh, God, you can solve all my problems. Oh, God, you can you can make my retirement great. Oh, God, you can find me the right spouse. Oh, God, you can keep our marriage together. Oh, God, it's all about me. It's all about me. Men and women, this other side of the cross is what I also call a cancer. A cancer that is killing our churches. A cancer that's silent and that's deadly. And it's a cancer I call cat theology. Cat theology. Now, I'm going to speak, obviously, using PowerPoint. It's a very different style. It's very fast, very quick. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Sorry for those of you who hate it. But uh, for those of you who love it, enjoy it. And it's designed, though, to get you to focus on what God wants you to learn. <clears throat> now, listening to me is, as you've already hopefully figured out, taking it like a, taking a sip out of a fire hydrant. You guys are going to get a ton thrown at you. I want you to sit back, relax, uh, and just enjoy it. And we're going to begin by discovering cat theology in Genesis chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and discover cat theology. Genesis chapter 1, we read these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water from the, under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit were seeded according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plant bearing seeds according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit was seed in according to their various kinds. God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day and God said let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years and let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth and it was so God made two great lights the, the greater light to govern the day the lesser light to govern the night he also made the stars God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night to separate light from darkness God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day and God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly across the earth, across the expanse of the, God, the sky. So God created the great living, the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems. And on and on and on, Genesis chapter 1 goes. Now, I've read through Genesis chapter 1 probably about a thousand times because that's about as many times as I've given this talk. And every time I read through Genesis chapter 1, I realize that everyone in my audience comes to a point of realization where they say to themselves, <laughs> This guy's going to read through the entire chapter straight through. <laughs> and they all start wondering one question. Why? Why? Why is this guy reading through the entire chapter? If I were to ask people why, they'd say things like, well, you know, we've kind of heard it before. We're not really very sure. You know, and most evangelicals are bored with Genesis chapter one. They're bored. Let's be honest. How many of you were... We'll just say not thrilled. We won't say bored. We're not thrilled with the fact that I was reading through the chapter. Let me see your hands. Come on, God's watching. Put them up high. Yeah, why is that? If I were to ask you, many answers would be given like, uh, hello, we've heard it before, or, you know, we're very familiar with it. Some might say, well, we're really not sure if it's completely true, you know. But none of that's the real reason. The reason most believers are bored with Genesis chapter 1 is due to a very simple fact, and that fact is this. People aren't People aren't there. I mean, we're a footnote at the end of the chapter, but the majority of the chapter, we're not there. And if we're not there, it must not be very interesting. Why? Because deep down inside, we think it's all about us. Most evangelicals don't get excited about the Bible until Genesis chapter 3. At least then mankind sins and we have something to live for. A rescue operation. Yes, let's save the lost. And non-verbally, we have communicated to God and to ourselves that this book, the Bible, is really all about us. 
It's about us. If I'm not in there, it must not be very good. Can we get to the meat of the Bible, please? Genesis 3 at least. I mean, then, then there's some action. Everything else is boring. Hey, we need to ask a very simple question about the Bible, and that question is this. Who is the main character? Who is the main character of this book? There are two possible main characters. One says this book is all about God. And if this book is all about God, we open up the pages of our Bible and we ask one very simple question. What does God get out of this? What does God get out of me going to heaven? What does God get out of saving me? What's in this for God? There's another second marrying character, and that is humanity, people, us. And if we read the Bible with that kind of perspective, we ask a very different question. That is, what do I get out of this? What do I get when I'm saved? What do I get when I go to heaven? This is great. What's in it for me? I want to make two very bold statements to you this afternoon. Statement number one is this. God is the main character of the Bible and lives to radiate his glory. And secondly, the average Christian today says God is the main character. Who's the main character of the Bible? Oh, it's God. But they live and act as if humanity is the main character and humanity often replaces God on the throne. Humanity often replaces God on the throne. Let me give you two very simple examples. We already went over one. If I were to say to you, to the average person, what is the, why did Christ come to the earth? The obvious answer is to die on the cross for our sins. It's true. It's real. It's not incorrect. It's incomplete. I want to challenge you that any time we get asked any kind of a theological question, it goes through an instant filter in our mind that says, what's in that? What do I get out of that? What's in that for people? What's in it for me? What's in it for us? Friends, glory, music, authority, uh, creation, things, feelings. What's in it for me? Why did Jesus Christ come to the earth? Mm, what did I get out of that? He took away my sins. What did God get out of Jesus' death? Some man jumped up and said, us. He went straight back to the instant filter. No, no, forget about us. He got glory, honor, praise, worship, obedience, this and much, much more. But I don't usually tend to think about that. Why? Because I think I'm the main character and I've missed so much. Second example, what is our primary reason why we don't want people to go to hell? So they won't what? So they won't suffer. That's right. So they won't suffer. Said with what kind of perspective? A God-centered perspective or a people-centered perspective? People. Instantly, we're worried about people. David has a very different perspective in Psalm 30, verse 9. He says, what gain is there in my destruction? Am I going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? David says, God, if I go to hell or if I die, who's going to give you the glory that you rightfully deserve? David is far more concerned about God not being praised than he's worried about dying. Whoa, that's a different perspective. Hmm. What about Jesus? We looked at this a little bit, but we're going to go over it again. Did Jesus focus primarily on us or his father in his death? Paul tells us why Christ came, Romans 15, 8 and 9. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that, whoa, there's a reason, says Paul, so that, so that what? So that the Gentiles, that's 99% of us here in this room, non-Jewish people, so that the Gentiles, what about us Gentiles? So that the Gentiles might not go to hell. Hey, I didn't think it said that. It doesn't. That's not what the text says. But what a perfect place to say it. Paul says that the Christ came so the Gentiles wouldn't have to go to hell. But that's not what he says. What does he say? So that the Gentiles may what? Glorify God for his mercy. You and I are saved for a purpose. We are saved not just so we don't go to hell. No, no, that's secondary. We are saved primarily to glorify God. In our business, in our work, wherever we are. And J Jesus endured the cross for the glory of the Father. Again, review. Jesus is now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was this very reason I came into this hour. Father, what does he say? Does he say, Father, save these kind, wonderful, worthy people from hell. They don't deserve oh, it. But this one doesn't say that either. No, it doesn't. What does he say? Father, glorify thy name. The constant theme running throughout the word of God, the glory, living to glorify God. Jesus died for us, yes. He died for the Father's glory, yes. But which one is primary? That is the key question. 
In the other talk, I call it, what is the, which side of the cross is primary? The other side of the cross or the familiar side of the cross? Jesus seems to put him in a priority, and he seems to say that the glory of the Father is a higher priority. But that makes some people think, doesn't God love me? Yes. He loves you as high as the heavens are above the earth. He has an infinite amount of love for you. But why does he love you? Because his love reflects his. And then it all gets back to glory. It all gets back to glory. Depending on who the main character of the Bible is, you'll have two totally different types of theology. I call them cat and dog theology. Now, I love my dog and my cat in Richmond, Virginia. Here's our dog, Jasmine. Jasmine's a white mixed lab. We all love Jasmine. Okay, here's our cat, Simba. As you know, cats and dogs are very different. Coming up to you, totally different. When I drive home Wednesday from the airport and my dog hears the car in the driveway, she's going to get out of the doghouse. She's going to be barking as loud as she can. She's going to run around in circles until I open the, the, passenger, the driver's door. She's going to put her front paws up. I'm going to scratch her behind her ears. Her tail is going to go 1,000 miles an hour. I know my dog loves me. When I go into the house where my cat is, not even going to acknowledge me. Won't even look at me. If he does anything, he'll jump up and get down and rub his head up against my leg. That's his way of saying, I own you, pal. <laughs> get me something to eat. Very, very different. Going outside, totally different. My dog wants to go outside, she barks. You open the first door, you open the second door, you can barely get it open fast enough, she runs out. When my cat wants to go outdoor, he sits in front of the window and silently screams to the world, I want out. You finally notice she's there. You go, you open the first door, you open the second door, and you wait. That's right. Cat just sits there, looks outside, looks up at me, looks back outside, looks inside, looks back outside, checks his watch, looks his paw, you know. I'm standing there. Come on, let's go, let's go. Finally, no sense of urgency. He gets up, puts his claws in the carpeting, marks his head up against the door, and right before he goes outside, he stops and sits. At that time, I'm so, I kick the cat out. I don't want him in there. There's a joke about their two different mindsets. I've already told it to you, I think. A dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. Oh, you must be God. Whereas a cat says the exact same thing. You pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me. Oh, I must be God. That joke characterizes Christian theology around the world today. There are those who say, you must be God. This book, the Bible, is all about God. There are those who say, no, I must be God. This book, this Bible, is all about me. That's right. Now, cats really don't say, I must be God. (laughs) Theologically, that's an incorrect thing to say. So what do they do say? They do say, it's all about us. God did everything for us. Creation is here for us. The internet is here for us. The sky, the clouds, the trees, everything is here for us. God did everything for us. That's wonderful. And Jesus left the Father's glory, came to the earth, suffered and died. Gone back to heaven. Now he's building mansions for us. It must be all about us. We must be what God lives for. Notice those words. We must be what God lives for. We don't live for God. God lives for us. Two different Christianities. Two are very Christian, but they're two totally different foundations. Two different mindsets are created in believers, okay? A cat says, God wants to bless me. What's a dog say? I want to bless God. A cat says, God serves me. A dog says, okay, now look, five of you are active and really hanging in there with me, okay? <laughs> I need the other 140 of you to to do it, okay? That's right. I serve God. First one is, God advances my kingdom. What's a dog say? I advance God's kingdom. Oh, how a big difference. God thinks the world of me. I think the world of God. God lives to make me famous. I live to make God famous. God is a means to an end. God is the end in himself. A cat says, what do I get out of this? And a dog says, what does God get out of this? Very good. And every person, you're going to find cat attitudes and dog attitudes. 
My secretary calls them catitudes. Catitudes are in all of us. Ask my wife. I have catitudes myself. It's part of our old nature. It's what we wrestle with all the time. So I want you to see some differences. I want you to look at eight quick differences between cats and dogs. Eight quick differences. And we're going to look at extreme differences, okay? Extreme differences. Most of us fall somewhere in the middle. But here we go over the extremes. Two different main characters results in two motivations for getting to heaven. Now, cats and dogs both agree there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. But they have different motivations. A cat, you see, walks away from hell. If hell is over there and heaven is over there, here's how a cat gets to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Hell, no, we won't go. Hell, no, we won't go. Hell, no, we won't go. Hell, no, I don't want to go to hell, no. And so they invite Jesus into their life. They bow their head. They put some prayer to it, and they add some faith and say, praise God, I'm not going to hell. And all the time, they got into the kingdom of God focused on themselves. They got into the kingdom of God focused on themselves. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. Dogs walk toward heaven. They've fallen in love with God. They see his beauty. They see his glory. They see his power. They've been consumed by it. And they say like my son Hunter said many years ago. I love this guy. He is so great. He is so great. And he, this is great. They fell in love with God. Hell? I never thought about it. Yeah, I guess I'm not going. It doesn't matter. I've fallen in love with God. Matthew 13, 44 can be interpreted two different ways. I believe both are correct. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his what? Joy. Went and sold all he had and bought the field. In his joy. Men and women, do you know what's supposed to characterize Christianity? Joy. How many of you know joyless Christians? Let me see your hands. I want to tell you primarily why they're joyless. Who are they focused on? Themselves. They go to church. They keep all the rules. But they've never turned around and discovered a treasure. You see, for a dog... It's the joy of discovery. For a cat, you see, it's the relief of escape. There are many Christians who are relieved. Whew. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Praise God. I hope you got fire insurance. I sure do. They're relieved, but they have no joy because they've never found the treasure. Another difference. Obedience. Obedience. You see, both cats and dogs want to obey God. Both cats and dogs seek to obey him, but their obedience looks very different. They both go to an obedience school, but the obedience school that they go to is very different. There's cat obedience school and there's dog obedience school. The dog is obeying the master, whereas in cat obedience school, the master is obeying the cat. Usually you see this in the form of prayer. Dear Lord, I want this, 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 and this. In the name of Jesus, I claim it. Amen. Obey me, God. You said if I said anything in your name, you'd give it to me. And so they cling. They cling to health, to wealth, whatever it may be. Dogs want people to obey God, whereas cats want God to obey people. Very, very different. How about in their quiet times? Both cats and dogs have quiet times. Both cats and dogs meet with God. Could be a half hour, could be an hour. Uh, but they both meet with God. But their quiet times are very, very different. Here's what a dog is thinking during a dog's quiet time. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Where is God's glory shining in my marriage? Where is God's glory shining in my obedience to my parents? Where is my God's glory shining in the way I handle myself at school? In the way I treat my teachers? Where is God's glory shining in the office where I work to my neighbors? Where is God's glory shining? Dogs are first and foremost concerned about God's glory. Well, cats have quiet times too. Here's what a cat is thinking when a cat has a I'm quiet time. I'm talking about me. Mine, me. Oh, I love having quiet I'm times. I love being the center of your attention, God. Oh, yeah, I'm Lord. Pet me here. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, right that's there, right. God. Scratch oh, me right yeah. there. 
Yeah. I love this song. And God, here's a list of how you can best bless me. I want this me. and this and then and this. I'll tell you how I want, want to serve you, God. Nothing hard, of course. I don't do Just suffer, the easy God. stuff. Your glory? What? Why? Why? No, no, later, Lord. Let's get back to my list first. It's about me, God. God, when I go to have a quiet time, I want to talk about what I want. I'm not worried about what you want. I'm not in this for you. I'm in this for me. So could you talk about changing my spouse, please? Because the way they treat me really hurts me. Don't worry about changing me. Change them. Very, very different. Hey, both a cat's heart and a dog's heart, they both beat for God. A dog's heart beats for God's glory, whereas a cat's heart beats for God's, but they both beat for God. Men and women, there are people in the churches just like the older prodigal son. They're in church, they teach Sunday school, they attend faithfully every Sunday, they obey every rule. And they're only in it for what they can get from God like a selfish bride. And they've never found the treasure. They're in it for them. And it's so sometimes hard to spot, hard to find. Okay, let's look at another difference. America and God. We talked about it in one of the services, maybe both. God bless America. The terrorists come. God bless America. But rarely do we sing America bless God. Now, if you sing America, bless God, to which there is no tune. You say, wow, it's about God. It's not about us. It's not about our nation. It's about the kingdom of God. And so what if God's kingdom would expand quicker and greater through a total economic collapse of the United States so that Christians have to scatter around the globe to find jobs and there share their faith. A dog says, bring it on. Bring it on. It's about the kingdom of God. It's not about our nation. Depends upon who the main character of the Bible is. Whether we say God bless America or America bless God. Okay, two different ways of viewing salvation. Okay, in cat theology, cats are saved from hell, and it stops right there. They're saved from hell, Whew, praise the Lord, I'm not going to hell, and it stops there. This is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. In dog theology, their view of salvation, they are saved from hell to glorify God. I'm saved for a purpose. You get up in the morning, I got one primary thing on my mind. What's that? How am I going to glorify God today? How am I going to glorify him at the office? How am I going to glorify him and how I treat my spouse in the next five minutes when he or she wakes up and I, I talk to them? How, is, how am I going to glorify God in the way I treat my kids? How am I going to glorify my God at my child's soccer game? How am, I, how am I going to glorify God? Constant. I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to make God look good. Not me. Not my children. I'm here to make God look good. Huge difference. Huge difference between being saved from something and being saved for something. Another difference, we touched on it a little bit. Difference in our prayers. In our prayers. Here's a typical prat prayer, a typical cat prayer that I hear prayed all the time around the globe in churches. Ready? This is going to be a shock for you. Here's a typical cat prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Period. End of prayer. That prayer is not incorrect. It is incomplete. That's right. When I hear that prayer being prayed deep down inside, as I'm in that prayer meeting holding hands with the people, I'm crying out, finish the prayer. Finish the prayer. He died on the cross for our sins so that, so that we might honor God, we might glorify Him, we might point to Him for His mercy. No, for a lot of people, once they figure out their sins are forgiven, 
It was all about me to begin with, and that was keeping me from heaven. I was really going to hell until that took place. So now that my sins are forgiven, praise the Lord, we forget about the rest of the prayer. And so what we pray is not incorrect. It's just incomplete, and it's killing our churches like a cancer, like a selfish bride. And we constantly come to God for what we can get from him. And we pray prayers that are all about us. We sing songs that are all about us. And the focus of most of the songs are about us. Not about God, not his glory. It's about us. Number seven. We've got eight. This is the number seven. How about in the area of our worship? In our worship. In dog theology, dogs worship God primarily for who he is, secondarily for what he's done for them primarily for who he is. So songs to dogs like How Great Thou Art and Indescribable, very comfortable to a dog, very much uh, for a dog's heart. Why? Because they exalt the living God for his glory. Cats flip it around. Cats, in cat theology, cats worship God primarily for what he's done for us, secondarily for who he is. So what do you think are the three Top words in a cat song. Me, my, and I. That's right. Me, my, and I. Why? What are they doing? They're singing about themselves in a Christian context. In a Christian context. Let's not forget that. This is in a Christian context. But they're still singing about themselves. The focus is still on them. They're not glorifying God for who he is. They're praising God for what he's done for them. And you know what I think? <laughs> Deep down inside, I'm thinking, what if God didn't do that for you? Would he still be worthy? Would he still be glorious? Or if he rightfully sent us all to hell, would we whip him the finger? And saying, forget you. We have to choose our songs wisely. Is it about us or is it about God? Number eight, look at another difference, blessings and glory, blessings and glory. Both cats and dogs want to bless God. Both cats and dogs want to glorify God. They want to be blessed by God and they want to glorify God, but they put a different emphasis on each one. In dog theology, dogs, a dog's desire to see God glorified is greater than their desire to see, be blessed by God. It's greater than their desire to be blessed by God. Now, dogs want to be blessed by God. Absolutely. Absolutely but they spend far more time worrying about God's glory. And so if they're ever going to take a loan out against their house, it's for the glory of God. It's not for them. The push came to shove. This is about God's glory. I'm going to do this for God's glory, not for me. In cat theology, it's reversed. In cat theology, our desire to be blessed by God is far greater than our desire to see God glorified. And if we do want to see God glorified, it's God, you'll get glory if you give me all these things. Give me these things, God, and I will so glorify you. I will so praise you, God, if you give me these things. And when God's glory points to something other than blessings, when God's glory says, hey, I want you to scale back. Don't get as big a house. Don't get as nice a car. Don't get as fast as a laptop. Cat thinks about it and prays about it and says... <gasps> I don't think so, God. I saw how you blessed David. I saw how you blessed Abram. I saw how you blessed uh, uh, Solomon. And uh, so, God, I know you want to bless me. So I'm going to trust you for that bigger house. I'm going to trust you for that bigger laptop, that faster laptop, that nicer car, God, because uh, I know you want to bless me. God's glory says, I want you to suffer to make my name famous. Cat thinks about suffering and says, That's just not us. I don't do suffering, God. I didn't give my life to you so I could suffer. God, if I want to do that, I could do a lot of other things. I gave my life to you so you would bless me, God. Bring down those blessings like you bring down the house. Yeah, God, I love it. I like it and I want some more of it. I just want to be blessed by you, God. That's all. That's why I gave you my life. I'm not going to suffer. God says, I want you overseas. 
I want you to go to Afghanistan. I want you to go to Iraq. I want you to go to northern Africa, where in northern Africa, it's roughly one missionary for every one million Muslims. Please don't send me to Africa. I don't think I've got what it takes. I don't think I got what it takes, God. I mean, that strange food and all. I God, I don't even do Taco Bell, you know, and... Lord, I, I took French and I, I almost killed that language. And Latin's already dead, God. There's no way I could learn those languages of Arabic, God. But I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll serve you here in suburbia in my comfortable middle-class life. Just give me a comfortable middle-class life. I'll tithe 11%. Okay, 12, 12. I'll even work with the youth, God. But please just keep me warming these pews. Eight quick differences between cats and dogs. Well, why do we have cat theology? Well, dogs, dogs study theology. Theo is the word for God. Ology is the study of. It's the study of God. And so dogs view life as a big, beautifully stained glass window. And he, they think that God, all God's trying to do is get behind the stained glass window and shine and radiate his glory in billions of different ways. And every little bit of glass is called a tessera. A tessera. So one tessera is uniquely, each tessera uniquely reveals God's glory. One tessera is the heavens. And the heavens, Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. If we were to study the heavens and to realize our one galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. Our sun is one of them. We're in one little cul-de-sac off into a corner of the galaxy. And it takes our sun 200,000 years to make one revolution. Just think, God, you're amazing. you got every one of those named and our galaxy is only one of hundreds of millions of galaxies each with hundreds of billions of stars god you're awesome yep the heavens were created to declare the glory of god another one is the plant kingdom god puts his glory on display every fall letting leaves change colors and to see their beauty and to have them fall and then the spring come back to life to look at the different flowers and the plants that he's made. God reveals his glory through plants. Taste. Did you know that God gave us taste buds for his glory? You know, God didn't have to give us taste buds. Do you all, are you all aware of that? God, there was no rule book in heaven that said, If thou shalt make a creation, it shall have taste buds. Okay, nope, no rule book. Uh-uh. God said, I want my people to taste my glory. I want them to taste a mango. I want him to taste a watermelon. I want him to taste an onion. I want him to taste broccoli. Why? It reveals his glory. Blessing us reveals his glory. Time, gifts, talents, cars, homes, careers, bank accounts. All of that reveals his glory. But here's what happens. Satan doesn't want people to see any of aspect of God's glory. Okay, this is where cat theology comes from. Satan hands out, I want to propose to you, a deck of cards. It's a deck of cards he passes out all over the world. And he's trying to get our eyes off of God's glory. He's done pretty well in the Muslim world, pretty well in the Buddhist world, pretty well in the Hindu world. But he says, oh, what do I do with these Christians? What kind of a card do I give Christians who already know God, who already have a relationship with God? What do I get their eyes focused on? Oh, oh how, how can I keep those Christians from focusing on God? God's glory. Oh. They'll never go for straight Satan worship. False religions. False religions. No. No, they'll see right through that one. Hmm. Now, which card shall I create for them? I know. Yes. I'll switch their focus to something safe. Something close to God's heart. <laughs> but take the focus off of his glory. <laughs> I'll make them think it's all about them. Yes, it's all about them. <laughs> them, yes. So may I propose to you, Satan's greatest strategy is to get us to think that this book is all about it's all about us. How does he do it? He takes the one tessera 
one of the billions of tessera that he reveals his glory and he says, forget about the glory part. Let's focus in on his desire to bless you. You know what? Let's make it the central focus of what the Christian life is all about. Oh, oh, all right. Let's make it the primary focus. Okay, let's make it the only focus. God wants to bless you. That's what Christianity is all about. This is wonderful. Gee, you're right. A little blurred, though. You know, could we sharpen it up a bit, Lord? Could you talk about how you want to bless me? Could you bless me with uh, <clears throat> money? Lord, I'll start at the bottom of the company, but in the next five years, seven years, could my you know, annual salary have two commas, Lord? I tithe 10%, Lord. That, that's more money for the church. That's a win-win situation, God. So could you bless me with more money? And God, I want some godly relationships. I want to have a godly spouse, godly kids, godly grandkids. Uh, could I do all that, Lord? And if you don't mind, a little power and prestige thrown in there, Lord. You know, when I speak, if people kind of quiet and listen to what I have to... I represent you, God. That looks good for you. So give me some power and prestige, and, you know, if you don't mind, Lord, one last thing. Could this whole thing be a hassle-free life? Kind of a Psalm 91 experience. The angels lift me up over the lines and the cobras. Can I have all that, God, please? Without realizing it, cats have made a foundational shift in their theology. Their focus goes off of God glorifying himself through blessing us. And we focus on receiving the blessings from God. And without realizing it, we become primary. God's glory becomes secondary. This is the essence of cat theology. We are primary. The glory of God is secondary. My feelings in marriage are primary. The glory of God revealed in my marriage is secondary. The distortion starts out small, but over time, that little tester gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until the entire Christian life is all about being blessed by God. God wants to bless you. Oh, this is great. I love it. You know, where's his glory? Oh, sure. It's in the corners. You know, I get out there on that golf course and swing away. Oh, I see his glory in the nature. Yeah, I love it. He did a cartoon book. 101 Differences Between Cats and Dogs. How Cats and Dogs View God. A dog says, ah, oh, my master. The cat says, Ah, my staff. We use God for our sakes. You see, whereas dogs study theology, cats study neology. Neology. Dogs know it's not about us because they know one key thing about life. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and... For him. You were created for yourself. You were created for your parents. You were created for your children. You were created for God. You are not your own. thought of it that way that's what the text says all things were created by him and for him for him all of life is for god therefore dogs go around asking a very simple question as they go through life what does god get out of this what does god get out of my marriage what does god get out of the way i parent my children what does god get out of the way i I, I uh, treat my grandparents. What does God get out of the way I do my work at the office? What does God get out of the way I drive? What does God get out of the way I, when I throw a piece of trash on the ground? What does God get? And so as they sing that, they think about that and they apply it to the scriptures. What does God get? So let me give you one verse of a dog. Genesis chapter 1 verse 20. It's the verse we quit on. Let, God said, let the water teem with living creatures. And a dog asks what? What does? What did God get out of this verse? And so they imagine. Hmm. Okay, okay. The living God walks into his newly formed ocean, waves crashing at his feet, nothing in the water yet. A and the living God uh, must have gotten some clay and, and began to flatten it and make his first fish. And as he flattened his first fish, he, he put some dorsal fins on it, and then the master got the paintbrush out. He says, I'm going to paint this baby yellow. So he paints it yellow. 
And he looks at it and he says, you know what? It needs some stripes on it. So he puts some white stripes on it. And then after the white stripes, he says, I think it needs a little black. And so he put a little black over it. And then he said, you know what? I think it needs some blue. And so it's some blue all over it. And God made his very first fish. He looked at it. He breathed life into it. He put it in the water and it swam away. And God said, yes. Ha! That was so much fun. I got to do it again. Spirit, come here. So the spirit came and said, I'm going to make another fish. This one's going to be a little rounder. I'm going to paint it black. I'm going to put my finger in the white and give it fingerprints all on the bottom. Give it yellow lipstick and a Nike strike right in the eye. He says, Jesus, you got to do this. He says, okay, okay. I'm going to make the prisoner fish because I set people free for the glory of the Father. And he made fish after fish after fish revealing his glory. And creativity was not limited to color. No, they made the gorilla crocodile. When, that, when they made the gorilla crocodile, the archangel Michael saw it. And he was up there in heaven. And he walks up to the father, a bit embarrassed. And the, stands there before the father. And the father says, spit it out, Michael. There's something on your mind. Oh, yes, God, you know everything. Yes, I do. Uh, uh, spit it out, Michael. Okay, the crocodile doesn't work. Could you be a bit more specific? Yeah, I I put it in the water and it flipped over, belly up. It's not buoyant. I am so sorry. You're perfect, but you missed it on this one. I'm so sorry. He says, no, you don't understand. Inside the DNA of this crocodile, I have him go around and eat rocks in order to keep upright. So today in India, there are some crocodiles that go around and eat rocks in order to keep upright. Now, if you don't think God wasn't having fun on this one, you missed the whole point of the talk. God had a blast in Genesis chapter 1. He says, the oyster, oh, I'm going to have it change sex frequently. Goes from male to female, from female to male to male to female. It's got one even better, the seahorse. I'm going to have the male carry the babies. And so the men give birth. And the angels saw the glory of the Father and they gave God a symphony of praise to God, declaring His glory. And God saw all the glory that was going to Him, all the joy of the angels and their celebration. God says, quick, there's so much excitement. Quick, we've got to write this down and share our joy with others. And so God wrote Genesis chapter 1. We were bored. Does the guy have to read through the entire chapter? Boy, he was good in the morning service. I don't think this is going to be very good. Why were we bored with Genesis 1? It wasn't about us. We didn't think through the joy God had in creating the stars. The joy he made an avocado with a big seed wasn't a mistake the joy of God nah why were we bored we're not worried about what God gets men and women we are so focused on ourselves we're constantly asking what do I get out of this what's in it for me we're like a selfish bride constantly going to God saying what's in it for me What's in it for me? And it's a cancer. It's a cancer that's killing our churches. Killing our churches. Cat theology, or if you'd like to put it in the other terminology this morning, the other side of the cross, they're the exact same thing, just in different terms. Cat theology is the primary reason for church splits. It's the primary reason for divorce in the church the primary reason why high school students, 80% of them give up on God when they go to college. They never learn to live for the glory of God. They learn to live for themselves in a Christian context. And when they got out of that Christian context and do whatever they want, and they said, it's still about me. Man, sex is a whole lot more fun than trying to keep the rules. So they miss it. They miss it because we've never been trained As a whole, as a church, globally, we haven't been trained that it's about the glory of God. We've always been trained that it's about us. Both in the church and outside of the church, we've gotten a consistent message. Life is about us. Men and women, life is not about us. 
It's about glorifying God. And you'll discover something very amazing when you live for the glory of God. Like our sister did who went to Afghanistan. As I heard about her and from her, as they went from house to house, sleepless night after sleepless night, they had joy bubbling out from inside of them. Why? Because they were involved in living for God's glory. You can have joy here at the office. You can have joy in Afghanistan. It doesn't matter where you are. What matters is are you living for the glory of the Father? Cat and dog theology, never let it create an us-them mentality. What do I mean by that? Oh, pastor, she's really a cat. Mm -mm. The moment you say she's a cat, he's a cat, you are doing the wrong thing. You're judging, and that is wrong. Judge not, lest you be judged. Never let this create an us-them mentality. Use it to encourage one another. Don't judge. Encourage one another. Hey, in 72 hours, you'll forget how much? 90%. That saddens my heart. Why? Because I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here for you to say, oh, I really enjoyed your message. Man, if you enjoyed my message, I didn't do my job. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to get a DNA change inside of you. And I know that's not going to happen in one afternoon. That's why I bring books. I bring books for your sake. Because unless you go through this material again and again... You're not going to understand it. Um, cat and dog theology. There is a study guide on the, on the internet. You can go to our website and get a study guide that goes with the book. It is in DVD form. For those of you who don't believe anything unless you watch it on television. Uh, there are also notes that go with the DVD. You can order that from the internet. I, I, don't have, I just can't bring everything. So there are notes for that as well. It's in MP3 form. 101 differences between cats and dogs. 101 cartoons designed to make you think. Okay, this was originally designed one for every potty in your house. Uh, and so um, it is uh, there. It's available if we sell out. Here's cats and dogs in a worship service. Okay, the dog is singing glory to God. And the cat says, he's so loud and off key. And I hate this song. Why me, Lord? What's a cat thinking when they're singing the song? Does it make... Me, feel good. I'm not worried about what God gets out of this song. I'm worried about what I get out of this song. Two different Christianities, cats and dogs. Uh, You can get that uh, in digital form. So if you want to just have it on your computer as a whatever, a screensaver, whatever, 101 differences, or you can get it as a black and white coloring. So you can teach your kids about cat and dog theology, have them color it in, and, and you can print it off and then just color it. Again, for children and grandchildren, I heard good news today. We've sold out, but if you sign up for any of this stuff that's sold out, I'll ship it here. should be here within a week or two. Emma's story. We've got about seven of those left out there. Emma's story, a true story. In 1999, there was an earthquake. In that earthquake in Turkey, hundreds of thousands were dead, millions were homeless. One four-year-old little girl had an entire apartment complex collapse on her. Four days after the earthquake, they, an American dog sniffed her out. She was so traumatized, they sent her to a mentally handicapped institute to die. My friends worked at that orphanage, said there's something different about this girl, and tried to adopt her. They went through hell trying to adopt her. In fact, the woman in Turkey in charge of all adoptions looked at my friend's daughter and said, you're prettier than I, you've got more money than me, I will never let you adopt this girl. This book was written by a 16-year-old homeschool girl named Stephanie Jenkins. I was holding a Bible study for my kids and their friends, and she said, Mr. Shogun, I want to write a book before I graduate. I said, really? Put her together, put the story together. She wrote it. It's phenomenal. Great as a family read. It starts out with God calling the angels together and saying, I want to show my glory off in a phenomenal way. And the angels shudder with excitement. Emma's story. I heard uh, back there. America, America, bless God, bumper stickers, wake up your neighbors. It's not God bless America. It's America, bless God. They are out there uh, if you want them. One website, uh, you can find it, uh, His Global Glory, or if you get one of the book cards, you can find all of our websites on those book cards, this book card that's right here. They are free. They are outside, and in, that, uh, in those bookmarks, you can find our websites. 
on the websites are free teaching. How many of you think this is significant teaching? Let me see your hands. Okay. How many of you would be willing to give it 20 minutes a week? Let me see your hands. Okay. Go to the website. Click on the journey. And then you've got tons of teaching you can go to. Tons of teaching to find out. Uh, let me just show you real quickly. Go to the journey. And you can, there's tons of topics over there on the right. The foundations, God's dream, Satan dreams, cat and dog theology, story of the Bible, prayer to go. And then there are multiple lessons in each one of those topics. They're just 20 minutes. Please, please. It's all free. It's free. We don't charge a penny. Go to it. Watch it. Multiple times get your life changed. Uh, and then the prayer to go, this is where you can download all the prayers onto your iPods. Prayers for children, preteens, teens, uh, uh, college students and adults. Click on them. It's all free. Get it downloaded to your iPod and start praying God centered prayers. Okay, we are going to take a five minute break, which will turn into 10 anyhow.